Democrat nominee for still unindicted President Hillary Clinton addressed the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People yesterday. The group, dedicated to keeping the fight for civil rights alive until it destroys every black neighborhood in America, welcomed Mrs. Clinton with a statement from NAACP President Beaufort T. Racecard saying, quote, <clears throat> over the last eight years, the median income of blacks has gone down, black enrollment in food stamp programs has skyrocketed, and the percentage of blacks who own homes has sunk. It's time we got a Democrat in the White House to fix things. When told there was a Democrat in the White House, Mr. Racecard added, yeah, but I meant a white Democrat. These black folks don't know what they're doing. Reading a prepared speech, Mrs. Clinton told the cheering crowd, quote, I ain't no ways tired, and I be gwine to fight for my homies until every cracker be like mofo. We best be leaving, so feet do you stop, unquote. Mrs. Clinton went on to say that black lives have been repeatedly harmed by teachers' unions that put their own job security over good schooling, welfare policies that encourage single motherhood, elite tolerance for a self-destructive and violent black street culture, and a victim mentality that denigrates personal responsibility and elevates anger and despair. This has worked well for us whites, and you colored folks seem to like it, so vote for me, Mrs. Clinton said. Addressing the increasing hostility and violence between black citizens and the police, Mrs. Clinton said, quote, it is time that America's police stopped racially profiling every young black male who happens to be running out of a convenience store with a fistful of cash and a gun. We need new use of force policies that will keep police officers from acting until it's too late. Then we can make some uplifting speeches at their funerals about coming together as a nation, and won't that be nice? So next time some cop shoots one of your young men, I want you to go out there and burn down your neighborhoods until your life improves. Or vote for Democrats, which amounts to pretty much the same thing." Unquote. Mrs. Clinton's speech was greeted with wild applause by the crowd. NAACP member Suicide P. Brown told a reporter, quote, "...there is nothing I like better than when some white woman with two mansions explains to me why my poverty is the fault of someone else. I mean, if I can't blame my problems on white folks, why, I'd have to take care of them on my own, so I'm just going to keep on voting Democrat until I got nothing left. And I'm going to teach the same thing to my children wherever they are." Unquote. Donald Trump, meanwhile, refused an invitation to speak before the African-American group, saying he felt he had already alienated every person of color in the country, and it was time to move on to whites. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. <laughs> so That's so cruel. I, I don't know. <laughs> so we're live. You know, people yesterday, here's, here's how it works. We're live on Facebook for 15 minutes, and you can come and listen at The Daily Wire. And if you want to watch, and tomorrow is mailbag day, right? <laughs> Woohoo, mailbag day. So you can only be in the mailbag if you subscribe. Now, a few people yesterday complained that they didn't pay their lousy eight bucks a month to listen to me crack myself up. Let me explain. You've got that entirely <laughs> you've got that entirely wrong. Possibly possibly we have, we haven't explained this right. You know, the thing is, you go out and earn the money, then you give it to us so we can have a good time. It's educational. You get to learn what it's like to live under Democrats. And then when the election comes, when the election comes, you think I didn't like that very much on the Daily Wire, so now I'm going to vote for Republicans. All right. So before we start talking about the convention, you know, we have to just I just want to put this in context a little bit because if you look on if you look today at the news, it's like Melania Trump and this speech she made and how it was like Michelle Obama's speech. One thing you don't hear about is this AP report. AP, the Associated Press got hold of documents. Here, I'll read it from the uh, New York Post. More bad news about the Iran nuclear deal landed Monday, a dangerous secret that President Obama has been keeping from the American people. The Associated Press reports that the unpublished side deal of this Iran deal is even more disastrous than the rest of the accord. It relaxes key restrictions on Iran's nuclear program in just over a decade, rather than the 15 years Team Obama has been touting. As of January 2027, Iran can start replacing its mainstay centrifuges with thousands of advanced machines up to five times as efficient as what it now has. The bottom line, the time Iran needs to produce a nuclear bomb would be cut in half. So thank you, President Obama. And remember, this is the deal they lied They lied to us about. Not only did they lie to us before, they, they told us that they were only negotiating with Iran because a, quote, moderate regime had taken place when they had taken uh, power when First of all, of course, the moderates aren't that moderate. And secondly, they had been negotiating with them before. Then they edited out archival tapes when the State Department spokesman basically told James Rosen, she said, yeah, we lied, and sometimes you have to lie, and that's it. So they just edited out of the archives. They just got to, you know, change. well, if we don't like history, we just 
change it. It's that simple. So though, that's, I just want to put this in context. Meanwhile, of course, we know now the Baton Rouge guy was targeting police, specifically targeting police. There was an axe attack on a German train. 17-year-old Afghani attacked uh, people with an axe on a German train. He was shouting, I think, Christ is Lord, or yeah. some, some, some religious thing. You know, maybe he was reciting the Ten Commandments. It was some religious thing. I don't remember what it was. But anyway, so I just, I just want you to remember that this is what's going on in our world. And of course, in Turkey, they're now punishing, cracking down, establishing this Islamist state, while the White House refuses to condemn them because we're sending out attacks on Syria from an airport in Turkey, so we don't want to offend them. So Obama's making all those mealy mouth speeches about the fact that this guy is cutting his people to pieces. All right, but of course, the big news the big news is at the convention, Melania Trump made a speech, and there were parts of it that were reminiscent of a speech made by Michelle Obama in 2008. So here's the, the cut. Barack and I were raised with so many of the same values. Like, you work hard for what you want in life. The values that you work hard for what you want in life. That your word is your bond, that you do what you say you're going to do. That your word is your bond, and you do what you say and keep your promise. That you treat people with dignity and respect. That you treat people with respect. Because we want our children and all children in this nation to know that the only limit to the height of your achievements is the reach of your dreams and your willingness to work hard for them. Because we want our children in this nation to know that the only limit to your achievements is the strength of your dreams and your willingness to work for them. See, now, some people said she plagiarized. I, I just think she wanted to hear what it sounded like when someone hot said it. <laughs> you know, just see the difference. Now, I, I, wanna, I just want to point out that, yes, you know, there, there were these similarities. And how, how dopey is this? I mean, here's this, this babe that Trump has got. You know, she comes out, she's charming. She speaks five languages. She's a businesswoman. She's all, you know, she's really an impressive person. The crowd loved her. How dopey. I mean, it's just typical of this campaign that they couldn't pull this off. I mean, these are, this is the easy stuff. You know, this is the easy. And first, Donald Trump, the entrance. Did you see his entrance? <laughs> he comes in in this smoke, like this rock and roll entrance, this smoke-filled thing. And then, like, of course, he burst out and it was Donald Trump. People ran for the air. Oh, my God, it's Donald Trump. You know? <laughs> People ran in terror for the exit. But I just want to point out one thing about Melania. Her speech was different from Michelle's in an important way. Here's a, another supercut that we made. I'm fortunate for my heritage, but also for where it brought me today. I traveled the world while working hard in the incredible arena of fashion. After living and working in Milan and Paris, I arrived in New York City 20 years ago, and I saw both the joys and hardships of daily life. On July 28, 2006, I was very proud to become citizens of the United States. The greatest privilege on planet Earth. For the first time in my adult <laughs> lifetime, I'm really proud of my country. It's a little different, a little different attitudes there. Some little plagiarism maybe, but also a little different. Attitude. The greatest privilege on planet Earth or not. And I mean, and by the way, as we're speaking in Cleveland, there are people marching in the streets shouting, America was never great. Not don't make America great again or America is still great, but America was never great. So that's who we're up against. And I just have to stop for a minute and just a, a quick sidebar here. I'm watching Fox News last night. I watched the convention on Fox News. And they started talking about Melania. And they're talking with Megyn Kelly and Wallace and Britt Hume and all these people. And this PC garbage where you're not allowed to talk about the fact that she's hot, that she's beautiful. And everybody has to, you know, they're sitting there with Megyn Kelly. You know, it's like, Megyn, you know, like, yeah, how did you think you got that job? You look like me, you wouldn't be there, you know? I mean, that's not the way. And not that she's not smart and everything, but this idea that you're not allowed to say that a woman's looks are a positive thing, that in her life they actually matter more than a man's. I mean, look, to be incredibly handsome is a great benefit, as I can personally attest. But I'm just saying that, that for women, it is an absolute, you know, 
an abs of something of absolute value. And why, you know, why do we have to lie? This whole thing that even the guys on the right are, have to lie about this, and we can't, we have to dance around it. I mean, obviously, you should be polite and give people their due, but please. Anyway, so let's look at the the good. So that was the silly stuff. Let's look at the the good, the bad, and the ugly. Rudy, I think Rudy Giuliani was the best part. He he did see this is this is why I like politics. Here's here's Rudy. He just gave him the red meat. It was just like raw steak. Ah, here it is. Eat, eat it. It's not, never mind philosophy. Never mind subtlety. Here he is talking about the cops. Right. We know the risk you're taking, and we say thank you to every police officer and law enforcement agent who's out tonight protecting us. Black white, Latino, of every race, every color, every creed, every sexual orientation. When they come to save your life, they don't ask if you are black or white. They just come to save you. What happened to, there's no black America, there's no white America, there is just America. What happened to it? Where did it go? How was it flown away? See, if you don't like this stuff, you don't like politics. This is what this is what politics is for. It's like watching it's like watching an old ball player come up, you know, to the plate with a gum and then to bat, chewing tobacco and spit. Like he's just a guy who knows urban urban politics. You know, he knows what he's doing. He comes out of the Democrat that Democrat New York politics. You know, so he really does sound in a way like a Democrat, but he's really selling it. Let's let's, let's take one more cut just for fun. This is this is on radical Islam. I just love this. This is this is really. Rudy doing that convention thing. In the last seven months, there have been five major Islamic terrorist attacks on us and our allies. We must not be afraid to define our enemy. It is Islamic extremist terrorism. I, I, for the purposes of the media, I did not say all of Islam. I did not say most of Islam. I said Islamic extremist terrorism. You know who you are. And we're coming to get you. I mean, come on, you know, like, I'm telling you, it's just, if you really, if you don't enjoy this, like, you really shouldn't be watching this stuff at all, you know, it's like, and I love the fact that they're getting applause for Islamic extremist terrorism, yeah, Islamic, you know, it's like, they're so, they're so tired of nobody, of, uh, you know, pussyfooting around it, that just the fact that he mentions it gets screaming applause, anyway, that's, all right, so that was, that for me was the high point of the whole thing. Of course, it started in chaos, and this is the big thing, you know, basically supporters of Ted Cruz went out and tried to force a floor uh, fight. They were led by uh, Senator Mike Lee of Utah and Ken Cuccinelli, who was the old uh, West Virginia Attorney General, I think he was, yeah. He, but anyway, they were out there fighting for the, the uh, Cruz forces, uh, trying to force a, jo a vote, a voice vote, a uh, uh, co roll call vote on the rules even though they knew they weren't going to win the rules vote. And they got shouted down, and the guy, they, they had to have a certain number of states to get the roll call vote, and so, so the chairman left, and he came back and said, you haven't got the states, but they said they had the states. You know, just a complete mess. Uh, here's, here's Mike Lee, the senator who was uh, in charge of it, making the case that they should have let him vote. I was pointed. This was a lost opportunity. It was an opportunity for the party to unite. Un unity happens when people with different viewpoints are respected and we're able to what discuss was your our goal disagreements. And seeking that vote. It's really very simple. We just wanted a roll call vote on the rules. Why? The first order of you business. You knew that in, Trump had the votes in the end, right? Yeah. Look, this this one isn't about Trump. For some people, it is. It's much bigger than that. It's about our rules. The first order of business in any convention, any convention of the Republican convention, as far as I know in any political convention is you adopt the rules. There was disagreement going out of the Rules Committee about the rules package that was adopted. There were a lot of delegates who, various for various and sundry reasons, wanted a roll call on that. That's all we wanted. 
and they shut that down. It's unfortunate because we need these people. We, we, the, the people who feel differently about the rules, for whatever reason, are the very same people the Republican Party will need come November to help us win elections at the top of the ticket, the bottom of the ticket, and everywhere in between. They- See, the thing is, too, I mean, this is, I, I thought that was kind of nonsense, what he's saying there. I mean, basically, he was trying to for, force a floor fight. He wanted to embarrass people. You know, with Ted Cruz, who has still not endorsed Trump, you know, is is basically playing the Reagan game. He's hoping that he'll be the nominee. I don't I don't personally believe that Ted Cruz is ever going to be president of the United States, but I think that he wants to come back. He's going to make a speech, and hopefully it's going to be his Reagan speech where he where people watch him and think, oh gosh, we could have had him. You know, that was you know, that was so great. He's going to talk he says he's going to talk about the future of the Republican Party. So to see how many times he mentions Donald Trump in the course of that speech, you know. We'll count them on like one finger of one hand how many times he mentioned. And then he hopes that, you know, we'll all remember and after four years of Hillary, it will be ready for Donald to be lowered from the ceiling. I mean, from for Ted Cruz to be lowered from the ceiling. I don't believe that's going to happen. The Hillary Clinton campaign, just to show you, I mean, look, you got to admire, you got to give the devil her due, and just to show you how efficient they were, within like hours, they had taken the floor fight and turned it into an attack ad because the theme of the day was Make America Safe Again, Law and Order. So they ran all the scenes from this. We'll play it. They ran all the scenes from this with the line, you know, Law and Order, where's the order? This has gotten off to a horrible start. The floor of the Republican National Convention is in a state approaching bedlam. Are we surprised that they ignored the voice of the people that obviously were screaming and you said, you know, let's keep this going. Go on, vote! They're continuing to protest here with a call of a roll call vote, Steve. This is unbelievable. This is not how you unify the Republican Party. The uh, podium has been abandoned. I've never seen anything like this. I'm very sorry. I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to do this again. You are ignoring delegates who have been elected to this convention. Donald Trump lost control of his own convention before he even started. So then it ends with where's the where's the order, you know? I mean that's so that's look, that that is what we're up against. You know, they we've just gone through a couple of weeks that any other Republican candidate would have used to climb ten points in the polls, you know, would be so far of Hillary now. I mean, she's been caught out lying, she's been humiliated by the FBI, absolutely humiliated. The law and order is out of control, always a good issue for the right, you know. Oh, I have to say goodbye to Facebook. So long, Facebook. Come to Daily Wire. We'll see you there. Uh, what's that? Uh, I, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear. Okay. Um, you know, uh, law and order has been out of control. The killings of the police makes the Republicans look great. The Islamic extremist terrorism, as, as Rudy Giuliani would say, has been out of control. Five attacks in seven months. Is it five attacks in seven months? Seven attacks in five months. It's been just all absolutely awful in, in the homeland, in the West. You know, really terrible. This is stuff that Trump should be able to use. Instead, we're talking about Melania, you know, plagiarizing stuff. Now, make no mistake, the left would, media would do what it will anyway. But it, it's always worse when they're right. So, you know, I was thinking, you know, a couple of weeks ago, last week and, and the week before, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg came out and she started attacking Trump. And we didn't talk about this because I didn't think it was much of a story, really. It was, it was kind of filler material. And Ginsburg starts attacking Trump. So here's a Supreme Court justice who's going to have to make decisions, possibly in a Trump presidency, possibly if there is a tie vote, she might have to do like Florida v. Gore. You know, she might have to do a, a make decisions about who become, becomes the president. And here she is saying that Donald Trump is the worst. He's terrible. Even the New York Times attacked her. But the thing that got me when the New York Times attacked her was all she was doing was revealing the fact that left-wing justices vote left. They don't vote according to the Constitution. They vote according to leftism. You know, this is the thing. This is, the left doesn't believe in meta reason. It doesn't believe in that higher reason that goes above the partisan fight. So the New York Times exemplifies what Ruth Bader Ginsburg is doing. They don't believe in reporting the news. Here's, listen to how they reported the uh, convention yesterday. This is their news report. This isn't the, this isn't the commentary. So the, from the New York Times, a former newspaper, with the overwhelmingly white audience hearing mostly from white speakers, Mr. Trump and his convention planners tapped two African Americans to rebuke black protesters across America who have decried the fatal shootings of black men by the the police. Sheriff Clark, and this is the, the Milwaukee sheriff who so fiercely denounces Black Lives Matter, 
Sheriff Clark rubbed salt in the wounds of critics of the police by referring to the killing of Freddie Gray in Maryland and saying there is some good news out of Baltimore, Maryland, as Lieutenant Brian Rice was acquitted on all charges. This is rubbing salt in the wounds. The fact is these guys should never have been prosecuted, never have been prosecuted. So the New York Times is just reporting their leftist imagination as the news because like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, like all the left-wing Supreme Court justices, they don't believe in the meta-mission. They don't believe that, for instance, whether you think gays should get married or not, it's not the, the role of five judges to suddenly declare it's in the Constitution. Of course it's not in the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that can be interpreted that way, but they don't care as long as they get what they want. It's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of the meta, uh, the meta construct of the Constitution that's supposed to govern our lives, the rule of law. So, you know, when we look at this convention it's easy to make fun of the convention because there was chaos and silliness, and there's always silliness in conventions. All conventions are kind of they're hor it's horrible showbiz. You know, if you do it, if you, even if you do it well, it looks bad because who cares? You know, I'd rather be watching something on HBO. You know, but we what it comes down to is there's just simply two sides to the Trump question, and they were beautifully expressed today in the Wall Street Journal. Two side by side regular columnists, Bill McGurn and uh, Brett Stevens wrote two columns today about this issue, and they just perfectly put the whole thing in a nutshell. Here's McGurn. He says, in this election, Mr. Trump is not running against himself. Though you might not know it from much of the commentary and coverage, he is running against Mrs. Clinton. On so many issues, free trade, the claim that Mexico will pay for a border wall, his suspiciously recent embrace of the pro-life cause, Mr. Trump gives reason for pause, but he still isn't Mrs. Clinton. That's crucial because much of the argument for keeping Mr. Trump out of the Oval Office at all costs requires glossing over the damage a second Clinton presidency would do. So he's saying if you're never Trump, you know, you're forgetting the fact that she's going to continue the Obama, the stagnant Obama economy, her horrible foreign policy. I mean, mostly her foreign policy experience boils down to Benghazi and the reset of Russia. That went well, you know. <laughs> so he goes on to say, you know, and, and on the cultural side, he goes on to say she is the candidate candidate who touts the Planned Parenthood view of human life, who sees nothing wrong with forcing nuns to provide employees with contraceptive, and who supports the Obama administration's bid to compel K-12 public schools to open girls' bathrooms to males who identify as female. She is the culture war on steroids. Whatever the shortcomings of Mr. Trump and his people, non-progressives simply do not share the itch to use the government to boss everyone else around. On top of this, an overreaching President Trump would not be excused by the press and would face both Republican and Democratic opposition. So basically it boils down to you got to vote for Trump because he's not Hillary. The other side of this comes from Brett Stevens. And Stevens opens up his column talking about First, he opens it up talking about Abraham Lincoln and how Abraham Lincoln forgave his enemies and called for malice toward none and charity toward all. And then he compares that to Donald Trump. In fact, we have a cut. You know, John Kasich has refused to come to the convention. He's refused to endorse Trump. And here's Trump yesterday talking about John Kasich. Look, I beat him very badly. I won 38 states. Uh, I won the highest number of votes in the history of the Republican Party. Uh, second was very, very far away. Uh, I beat him very, very soundly. And you have to understand, this was a contentious, some people say the most contentious primary they've ever seen either party. If I were him and got beaten that badly, I probably wouldn't show up either. He has a problem, though. He signed a pledge. And from a standpoint of honor... I think he should show up. I also think this. If this were the Democratic convention, I think he should show up because it's good for Ohio. I wanted it to be here, and we had lots of choices. I want So malice toward all, charity toward none. You know, he's not, this is not the Lincoln Party. And Brett Stevens goes on to talk about how the character of America has changed, so that we accept, we accept Obama's lies about health care, about a Rand deal, and he's still, you know, we're still saying, the guys at the New York Times are still saying, what a brilliant man, what a, a scandal-free administration, what a wonderful guy. Hillary Clinton, you know, they're still, they talk about her every now and again, they'll pause and reflect on the fact that every word out of her mouth is a lie. But, you know, the, the, the character of America has changed, and it's obviously changed on the right, too, that this guy Trump is elevated. So this is what Brett Stevens is saying. And he says, if Republicans are going to spend the next few days talking about making America great again, shouldn't part of that discussion also be about making Americans great again, or at the very least, making us better? 
From its beginning, the impulses that have dominated Mr. Trump's candidacy are the insult, the put-down, the slander, the threat, the refusal to apologize. These have poured out of him in such profusion and such velocity that they have degraded Republicans simply by accustoming us to them. Mr. Trump's apologists praise this as a refreshing burst of political incorrectness, but that just betrays an ignorance of what it means to be politically incorrect, saying you aren't worried about global warming is politically incorrect. Making fun of physically disabled reporters is called being a creep. But that isn't all we've grown used to. Mr. Trump doesn't merely lie, as Hillary Clinton does. His statements are postmodern and that they have no connection to a foundational concept of truth. That's beside the point. What's at stake in Cleveland this week isn't the identity of the next president. It's the identity of the GOP, its ideas, its leaders, its followers, above all, its character. So those are the two things, and I think that sounds a little bit like Ben, I think, talking, you know, basically, if, you know, if we plunk for this guy, we basically poison our brand, essentially. I, to me, I mean, those are two points of view. To me, it seems to me you can hold both those points of view in your mind at the same time. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong. There's going to be an election. One of these two people, unless something happens, is going to be the president of the United States. There's nothing wrong in saying, in choosing which one of them is going to do the least harm to your uh, country in those four years while you rebuild your brand. I'm not afraid of people pointing their finger at me and saying I voted for Donald Trump. I'm not afraid of people pointing their finger at me and saying any damn thing they want. You know, the point The point is, will Trump be less damaging to the country than Hillary? Yeah, probably. I mean, you know, a poisoned adder as president, which is essentially what we're getting, would be, would be better for the country than Hillary Clinton. But it is true that the, that the Republican Party has lost its way and that this is... You know, it's very, very destructive for the country, and we're going to have to rebuild the conservative brand, and we're going to have to rebuild it in such a way that people will buy the brand. I mean, whether it's in finding the candidate that they like or in finding policies that somehow soften the blow of freedom, because freedom is tough, and when you sell freedom to people, they don't want it. What they want is safety, you know, and especially now, I think, people just want to be safe. You know, we're going to have to rebuild that brand, and I think those are two things that are that are both true at the same time. It's not really a question of like, oh, am I going to vote for Hillary or am I going to vote for Trump? I, you know, I would never vote for Hillary. I mean, I really, I would shoot myself in the foot first. But that's, but that's not the point. The point is that this is a bad guy. This is a guy who has no connection to the truth. This is a guy who's never read the Constitution. And if we don't say that, if we don't speak out, you know, then, then we truly have soiled our brand in the true way, which is that our brand has become poisoned and dishonest. All right, this brings me to stuff I like. There is a thing on, now I, I'm going to preface this by saying this stuff is really disturbing. Not all art is pleasant. You know, some people yell at me and say, oh, you know, when I, art is an escape, it should be better than real life. I don't believe that. I believe that art is a, a path to wisdom, okay? Some art is really, un, not, it, not unpleasant, it's just disturbing. There are, is a series of videos on YouTube now called Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. It was created by two British artists, Becky Sloan and Joseph Pelling. They originally put it out on their own website, and it's now uh, become an inter a YouTube sensation. I think the first one has like 38 million hits or something like this. What they are is they're kind of takeoffs on Sesame Street. They're these little kids, uh, these little puppets, uh, yellow guy, red guy, and duck guy. And in each one, somebody comes and introduces a happy-go-lucky concept like creativity. So here's the one, the first one is about creativity. So we'll play just the opening of this. What's your favorite idea? Mine is being creative. How do you get that idea? I just try to think creatively. Now when you look at this orange, tell me please, what do you see? It's just a boring old orange. Maybe to you, but not to me. I see a silly face Whoa. walking along and smiling at me. I don't see what you mean. Because you're not thinking creatively. So take a look at my hair. Cool. I use my hair to express myself. That sounds really boring. I use my hair to express myself. Now, when you stare at the clouds in the sky, don't you find it exciting? No. Come on, take another oh, look. Oh, wait. I can see a hat. I can see a cat, I can see a man with a baseball bat I can see a dog, I can see a frog I can see a ladder leaning on a log Think you're getting the hang of it now? So it starts off with that, okay, and then it slowly devolves into 
utter horror. <laughs> and it just goes from creativity to they start thinking creatively, and all the thoughts start coming out of their head. And of course, not all thoughts are clean and wonderful and swell. So they get, they find by the end, they're writing like death on the thing. And, like, and the little pad who's singing the creative song, let's all agree to stop thinking creatively. <laughs> and each one deals with a different subject. So like the one, there's one on health, which the one on health I thought was actually going to give me nightmares. It was so spooky. And there's one on technology. And there's a, and the and the idea, there's lots of uh, theories on the internet about what these are about. It has all these little mysterious things like the date June 19th keeps coming up and all this. But I, I, I think just in an overall way, let alone what they're specifically about, they're about the ways in which happy-go-lucky concepts simply do not contain the full existential truth of life, the full existential horror of life. And I think that when we look at the world, when we're, whether we're looking at it politically or not, you know, the little categories that we want to put things in, the little right and wrong, black and white categories that we want to put things in simply don't work. And the fact that life is complex, that it's messy, that it's horrific, that it involves death and tragedy are things that, like, the entire society works to hide from us. And these little cartoons that they made just brilliantly bring out the way that the, that terror kind of rises to the surface, no matter what you're talking about. It's disturbing stuff, but I have to say it's absolutely brilliant. Don't hug me. I'm scared and I love the title, too. It's great stuff. Anyway, we'll be back tomorrow with more craziness and chaos, assuming we're still in the same world, in the same country. There will be more craziness and chaos to come, and we will be here to talk all about it. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show.